Good morning, officially. I want to begin with just a little bit of an announcement today. Uh, about a year and a half ago, the district came to our church and to me and to the board uh, in particular and asked if we would be willing to partner with some other churches and become what they're calling a network hub church and be willing to invest and help some other uh, congregations in the moment that they find themselves in. And so a year ago, we began to partner with Watertown and we broadcast our first hour service to them every week. Uh, starting today, we're now partnering with a newer church plant in Aberdeen. And so we're partnering with them also, and we're excited about that. And I just want you to know about that. And I feel like we just lost our lights. And so at any rate, um, I don't know what that means, but um, I would encourage you to pray for Watertown and Aberdeen as you pray for things in your life. Um, also, this is the hour that we do Facebook Live. And so I want to talk to all of our Facebook Live uh, congregation. I know a lot of you live in these parts of the state that I just talked about, whether it be Watertown or Aberdeen. And so I would encourage you that you might want to check one of these campuses out and uh, find some fellowship there with some other believers. So at any rate, I'm on to the message now. Um, this morning I'm continuing on in our summer uh, theme of doing life wisely. And today we're going to look at what it means to use the right uh, building materials. Now over the years I've done quite a few building projects. And I remember my first major building project was when we lived out in the country. When we were here in the 90s, uh, we put up a pole barn. And that was quite an experience for not knowing at all what I was doing. It measuring everything about five times and making sure we got that thing up uh, square and straight. And then about the same time we did that, I, I went to my mom who was then alive. And I said to her, I, I will be, I'm willing to build this cabin that you want to build and put it on our lake land that we have as a family. And I thought it was going to be just this little like big, well, little simple cabin thing. It turned out to be a house. And so that took about 15 years. I think I learned a lesson there. I'm not sure what it was, but it took a lot longer to build than I thought it would. And then over the years, both Vicki and I have done a ton of small renovation projects on every house we've lived in. And one of the things I've learned is this. When I go to buy a two by four from a lumber yard, I never just take it off the rack. I take that thing down and I put it on the floor and I make sure it is straight and square. Because I found out this. If you have crooked two by fours, you will have a crooked wall. And if you like ocean waves, that works good. But if you want a square wall, you will take the time up front to look over your building materials that are hidden from everybody else, but produce something that's true and straight. What you build your spiritual life on matters tremendously more than a wall you may construct in your life. And to be a true person and to live the straight life that you're called to live, you need to build your life on the teachings of Jesus, and you need to put them into practice. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew, kind of like last night, right? And beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Do you think that either one of these builders, when they began to build their house, thought this way? Well, I'm going to build this cruddy old house, knowing that it won't stand the test of a storm. I'm just going to do something substandard, and I know it won't endure. I don't think that was the thought process here. Here's what I think we need to understand. This is our introductory thought this morning. Most likely, both the wise and the foolish builder wanted an enduring house. But their success, their success was dependent on the right knowledge followed by the right actions. Amen? 
Their success was dependent on the right knowledge followed by the right actions. Now, in the case of the foolish builder, I think two things could have transpired. I think two things could have taken place. First, that one just didn't know any better. He was ignorant of good building practices and contrary to the saying that ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is not bliss. If you say ignorance is bliss, you need to lose that or only say it in joking. Because ignorance is not bliss. It's usually disastrous and harmful. And so perhaps this builder who built on the sand just didn't know any better. Or, and this may be a little bit more of a stretch, or he could have thought, well, this is cheaper, this is easier to do, I'm going to do this and just hope it never catches up with me. You ever do anything like that? You ever say, well, I know what I should do. I don't want to take the time to do it, so I'm just going to do this and hope it's good enough and hope it never catches up with me. I think we do that a lot more than we recognize when it comes to our spiritual lives. I think we know some things at times, and we choose not to do them because we think, well, this is just a little easier. It's not as stressful. And we cut the corners hoping it never catches up to us. Get this critical life perspective. You are building your life on something, amen? What you build on matters tremendously. What you build on matters tremendously. Now, I... I can't speak for everybody, but I think this is kind of a common practice. We, when we're young or maybe midlife or even older, sometimes we go to college and we'll put all this energy into trying to get into this career and we'll build like crazy into that so that we can be successful in our life and we kind of see knowledge put into practice, makes sense, right? And some of us want to be financially well off so we get knowledgeable about how to invest and then we invest and then, you know, hopefully we have success, but we do that knowledge and practice, hopefully it meets success. Now, in our generation, in our time, boy, health is on a lot of people's radar, isn't it? it? It's never been like this as long as I lived as it's been lately. And so people are studying how to eat right and consume the right kind of diet and doing some health practices. Why? To live a long, fruitful life. And these things are important, but they, my friends, are not life. They are just temporary kinds of things. And we have to have that same kind of attitude when it comes to our spiritual well-being. We have to know the teachings of Jesus. We have to put them in practice because on the other side of that is what? Blessing. On the other side of that is life to the full. There are two ways that we can build our lives on rock material that Jesus identifies for us in this teaching I read to you this morning. I call this wise building. One, know the teachings of Jesus. Know the teachings of Jesus. Because what you don't know can hurt you. I may have said that too too lightly. What you don't know will most likely hurt you. It will most likely do you damage. Let me give you some examples. We just saw a whole bunch of people dedicating little ones up here. You know what? If you have a two-year-old... Your goal as a parent is to keep that two-year-old from harm, right? It's pretty simple. They don't know any better, amen? If you think they do, you don't have a two-year-old. So you put the plastic outlet things in the, in the plugins because for some reason they're attracted to those and they want to stick their finger in them. You put up the gates, right, at the top of the steps that are just annoying. We had a gate up for like 10 years. And every time you go up and down the stairs, I remember thinking, is it worth it? Because I don't want to go over that gate. Or opening and shutting the gate. They never work very well. Yeah, someone should design one of those that actually work well. Anyway, um, you know, and, and you, so you put the gate up. And then the, my favorite is the plastic doorknob things. And nobody can then open that door, including the parent. It's so frustrating. You go, how do I, yeah, you got like, to have a gorilla grip strength to open the door from that point on. I remember when Brianna's twin boys were little. And we were at our lake place, and they got up early one morning, and we didn't know this, and on the way out of the cabin, they were like, I don't know, two or three, they were just little guys. And out of the, way, out of the cabin, they were going out to, towards the lake early in the morning, they grabbed a pan of brownies, because after all, if you're going to go to the lake, you might as well have brownies, right? So evidently, they went down there and ate a bunch of the brownies, and then when they were done, for some reason, I think they thought it'd be a good idea to throw the pan into the water 
And I mean, maybe they're trying to do dishes. I don't know what they're thinking. They're little. And then they made their way back into the cabin. Well, later on, it was discovered what they had done, and we were all kind of like, this was not a good thing. So from that moment on, Peter, my youngest son, slept in front of their door every night so that they couldn't escape and make their way to the lake because who knows what a two-year-old will do in the lake, right? It, it's a dangerous situation. Well, speaking of the lake, we, uh, we had been on the lake for a while, and I remember uh, coming into a, a little bit of cash at one point and telling our family, let's go buy a jet ski. We all wanted a jet ski. But I, uh, I'm very cheap. Any of you relate to me on that? I didn't want to buy an expensive jet ski. So I remember going down to the marina and saying, we want a jet ski that can pull a ski or I love to ski. Amen. Anybody love the ski, water ski? Oh, you guys are so South Dakotan. I figured someone would jump up and go, yeah, yay. But no, we live in South Dakota, land of no lakes. But, uh, you know, uh, I wanted something that would pull a water skier and something that would pull a, a tuber. And, and so they had uh, a sea Bombardier GTS that was like a three-man jet ski. It's like a little boat more than a jet ski. And this guy at the marina said, we'll give it to you for $1,600. My heart just leapt for joy. Uh, and he said, there's two things you need to do to maintain this jet ski. Two simple things. Change the plugs every year and make sure you fog the engine at the end of the season. I said, okay. So for about 15 years, I faithfully did that, thinking I was maintaining the jet ski. Amen? Because that's what I was told. Well, this last year, right in the last day, right before we went, the jet ski didn't go anymore. It would just go, wee, wee, but it didn't go anywhere. I said, oh, no. And I thought, well, we got 15 good years out of it, right? I'm rejoicing. I get on it, wee, and I said, okay. So I started tearing it apart. I said, how hard can this be, right? Some of you men know what I mean exactly. How hard is it going to be? So I, I pull off this impeller assembly. First of all, this is what makes it go. It's got a little impeller in it, right? And I thought, oh, that turns pretty good. That's cool. That should work. And then I noticed that there's this this drive shaft that connects it to the power takeoff of the engine. So I yank that out of the back of the boat, and it comes out. And I noticed this little spline gear thing is gone. I said, I think that's problematic. That's why it's going, wing, not going anywhere, because there's no little spline gear. So this is a brand new one, by the way. So then I did something I'd never done before on that jet ski. I began to wonder if I should have some maintenance on these parts. So I pulled out the guard that was over this, because all you could see was a guard. And I said, oh, no. There sat this water seal with a grease zerk. And then I noticed where this came out of had a grease zerk. Do you know what that is? That's where you put grease in. All right. Guess what I have not done for 15 years? Hmm, that's pretty good life, actually. I said, oh, that's problematic. There's no grease. And then I begin to think to myself, I wonder if this thing needs to be maintained because it turns on something and there's got to be bearings in there. And so I did what every good guy does anymore. I looked at YouTube. And I looked up and I said, this guy said, so you want to know if you need to maintain your impeller? Yes. There is oil inside this thing. I said, oh, no. (laughs) You're supposed to change the oil, uh, you know, they were saying yearly. I said, okay. (laughs) So right away, I just ordered new bearings and a new shaft and everything that goes in here because I said, it's got to be bad. So I pulled this little cone off and about two tablespoons of oil drip out of there. That, my friend, is not a good sign. And it reeked. It smelled bad. So I get my lovely wife out there because I'm trying to loosen something off this and I have it clamped to a sahor, and every time I tried to turn it, the whole thing would turn. So I needed some weight. So I called my wife and said, you need to sit on the sawhorse for me. <laughs> Wives are handy, aren't they? <laughs> so I get her out there, and the moment she walks out the garage, she has a good smell. I don't have good smell. What stinks, you know? And I said, that is 15 years of neglect you're smelling right there. It's very badly burnt oil. And I begin to think, what you don't know can hurt you. Because I just didn't know. I should have known, right? I'm pretty mechanically inclined. I should have thought, it's not like magic that this engine turns and this propeller turns. There's something in between there. But you know, it just worked fine, and I never gave it a thought in the world until it broke. And then all of a sudden, I became very occupied with what 
is going on here and how does this work? Jesus says to us, my knowledge to you is essential. You need to know some things. If you don't know some things, guess what you'll do? You'll break. At some point in your life, you're going to stink things up. And it's because you don't know. Ignorance is not bliss. And Jesus begins this teaching to us saying, hear these words of mine. Well, this teaching I read to you this morning from Jesus is at the end of what is called the Sermon on the Mount. It's the first public teaching of Jesus Christ to this world, basically. He sits on the side of a mountain and begins to teach about kingdom principles and about kingdom truth. And at the end, he says, you need to hear these words of mine and you need to put them into practice. So what are the words we need to hear from Jesus? Well, he begins his teaching called the Sermon on the Mount with uh, what we call a list of beatitudes. And I call these beautiful attitudes that the follower of God needs to embrace. And the very first one he says is this, blessed are the poor in spirit. And we go, what does that mean? Well, someone who's poor in spirit is someone who knows their brokenness before God. They know their desperate need uh, 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 of God and his intervention and salvation. Jesus says, blessed are you when you understand your brokenness because you will be one who experiences uh, the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to say, blessed are those who mourn. And when he uses that word mourn, it doesn't mean we go around just or we're sad. No, we're mourning over our sinfulness. We're mourning over our separation from God. We understand that something is not right. He says, blessed are those who mourn because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he goes on and says, blessed um, are those um, who are meek. Blessed are those who are meek. Now, meekness means you are willing to put the control of your life and the strength of your life under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Blessed are the meek. He says, you're going to inherit the earth. And then he goes on and says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst uh, after righteousness. That means such a one that says yearning for Christ in their life. They're yearning to look at life through the eyes of the Lord Jesus. And he said, um, for you're going to be filled. He said, you're going to be filled. Blessed are the merciful. The merciful are those who look at neighbors and they look at people around them, they look at family members, and they see them like God sees them, and they're sympathetic sympathetic understanding of the plight that they're going through. He said, if you have that attitude, you're going to obtain mercy. Then he goes on and says, blessed are the pure in heart. These are the ones who are washed by the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and have been set aside to the glory of God and filled with the person of the Holy Spirit. He said, blessed, blessed are, are the pure in heart, um, for these ones will literally see God. And then he goes on and says, blessed are the peacemakers. Peacemakers are one who reconcile God and men, God and women, God and children, he said, because you're going to be called sons of God. And these are beautiful attitudes that if we embrace on this side and begin to say, yay, I'm going to live that way, then we're going to experience blessedness on this side because of that. We're going to experience right life. And then he goes on and he's in the Sermon on the Mountain and he says, um, you who are my followers, you're salt and light. You're to be the flavor of God to this world, and you're to be the preservation agent to this world, and you're to be a light. You're to show people what it looks like to follow me. So you're like lighting the way uh, uh, to me. And then he goes on to all these other things. He says, talks about murder and adultery and divorce, oath taking, eye for eye. And he says, really, all these are matters of the heart. And you, you've got these external laws telling you not to do these things. But he says, I want to get after your heart. It says not to murder. I tell you, don't get angry. It says, don't, don't you know, uh, commit adultery. I say don't lust. And he goes, um, when you take o- oaths and things and you say you can't take an oath or you swear by this or you swear by that, don't do that. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Be a person of integrity. Um, and eye for eye, no. Turn the other cheek. Don't seek revenge. Leave revenge up to the Lord. And he kind of just gets this depth of understanding of the heart. And then he gets into the topics of prayer and giving and fasting, and on all three of these, he likewise says, you know what? The religious people of your day, they do this in a public display of grandeur. No, you instead, you do this in secret. And where your father 
sees you in secret, he will openly reward you. And I, my favorite one of these three is the giving. And, I, and he says, don't do like, well, I think he called them hypocrites, but don't do like they do when you're, t- you're, you're, you're religious leaders. Don't do like they do. You know what they used to do? They would go on the corner and they would get out the trumpet and they would honk it. I don't have a trumpet. And they would say, I am now going to give alms to this poor person. And they would give. Is that not ridiculous? This, by the way, is called tooting your own horn. And Jesus said, they've already received their reward, the recognition of people. Instead, when you give, do it in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Amen? But don't toot your own horn. It's kind of loud, isn't it? I like it. Um, at any rate, so he gets at these really what I would call earth-shaking teachings. And, and, and then one of my favorite uh, in the Sermon on the Mount is this one. He says, who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? And I frequently quote that myself, quote that to myself saying, Steve, this worry will get you nothing. It will add no time to your life. It will wreck your body and it will mess up your soul. Amen? Who by worrying can add a single hour to their lives? And these kind of teachings are the ones that Jesus says, hear these teachings of mine. It's the Sermon on the Mount. Hear these teachings of mine. Put them into your mind. Know where the grease zerks are. Know that there needs to be oil changed in the impeller. Understand what's up when it comes to your spiritual life. You know you need to know these things. Because if you don't know them, they'll hurt you. And then if you go to the whole Bible, it needs to be our approach to life. We need to know the things of God. In the beginning, God created. So God's creator. We're our created beings. There's an author and giver of life. There's a creator and a creation. We need to know that. And what's our problem? Well, the problem happens right away with Adam and Eve. They sin. They thought they could be like God. That is the problem that humanity faces. We think we can be like God. We can run our own lives. That is the problem. When everything is torn down and stripped bare, there is the problem that we all face, is that we're sinful and we think we can be like God. And then you see all throughout the Old Testament a foreshadowing of Jesus and prototypes of Jesus all over the place. These examples and point to what God's going to do. And then Christ came, of course, and fulfilled all these things. And the Old Testament becomes for you and I examples through which we can learn vicariously without having to go through things ourselves. So we know where the grease fittings are, so we know what the oil is that needs to be changed. Amen? So we don't have to figure it out by getting broken. So here's our challenge for this fall. Will you read and memorize and meditate on the Word of God? Will you read, memorize, and meditate on the Word of God? We are providing you with this study guide. It's free to help with our Battle Within series from Romans 6, 7, and 8 this fall. And I would encourage you, do this on your own. If you're not doing it in a group, do it with your spouse. Do it with a family member. Do it with some coworker, or do it in a group. But use this companion material to read, memorize, and meditate on the Word of God. I like one section in here a lot, the memory method. I don't know about you. Whenever someone says to me, memorize something, I go, oh, boy, I'm too old to memorize. You ever say that? No, you're not. You're just probably using the wrong technique. So let's show how this technique works. It's in this book. But say you want to memorize Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you look at that, and of course you can just repeat it over and over and over again. I used to, you know how I memorize? When I memorize, I take something like that, write it out, and I go running, and I read it a thousand times. Pretty much you have it down then. But here's a great technique. You take the first letter of every word, I think Jim Merritt worked with Serenity, Pastor Serenity on this and put it into the book. You take the first letter of every word and you write it out. And this scripture is pretty familiar to a lot of us. So you can look down at the bottom. Don't look at the top with me, but you can go, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can just sit there and rattle it off just from the letters. And then pretty soon you don't need the letters. You want to memorize and meditate and read the Lord, 
God's word because you need to know. Because if you're in the know, then you're not going to do dumb things that break you and pretty soon stinking up your life. Amen? So that's what this is for, to help you in that endeavor. So I want to encourage you to grab one of these. If you haven't grabbed one of these, and it'll be a great tool. So now let's move on to the second part of the message here, the second part of wise building, and that is put the teachings of Jesus then into practice. I found myself thinking this way about the jet ski. Oh, shoot. I remember saying that as soon as I saw the grease fittings. This is not going to end good. This can't be right. Okay, I can grease those. Those are super easy. You just put a little grease gun on, you're done. Literally takes about 10 seconds of uh, 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 zerks, right? You know, you just put it on there and you just, okay, you guys know that. Super easy. You know what I thought here? Hmm, I wonder if I have to do that that often. Right away, I begin to think that way. Because that was a little bit of work. That took me a few hours to kind of figure that out and get it full of oil. And, you know, it's just not simple. I go, why didn't you make this simple? Why didn't you just put like a drain plug in it and, you know, if you're supposed to change it out, why do you have to take the bolt out and drain it? And, you know, it's kind of, kind of, kind of clumsy. So I right away thought this way. Hmm, it lasted 15 years. <laughs> I bet it'll make five years pretty easy if I just go five years. And then I begin to laugh. What am I doing? It's like... Three dollars of oil and it takes about a half an hour. What am I thinking? You know, I just need to change it out. I hate doing that kind of stuff. I'm busy. I don't want to do it. When I'm at the lake, guess what I want to do? I want to be in the water. I want to ski or fish or be with the family. I do not want to change oil in an impeller. Nor do I want to pay anybody to do that because I'm really cheap. So I thought, but right away I started thinking, what can I get by with here? And that is our human propensity. If it's easy, we say, oh, I'll just do that. But if it gets a little hard, uh, what can I get by with? So continuing on here uh, in this, by the way, uh, there's a mess up in your note-taking guide. I noticed it last night. This reflection point is really our challenge point from section one. (laughs) And I had it originally in the notes, and I forgot to take it out when I changed it all. So you can write in there again where you read, memorize, and meditate on the Word of God. Maybe I just want you to really get that down. Uh, or you can just cross it off and say, Pastor Steve screwed up here. So whatever you want to do, uh, that's fine, but that, that point is a bit redundant. So we might readily do the easy things in our Christianity. You know what's easy? This, what we're doing today. Getting up and going to church is pretty easy. That's Greek Cirque stuff. It's super important. I'm not minimizing that. The Bible says don't neglect the gathering together of the saints. You need to gather with other believers and encourage one another in your faith. But this is easy, guys. Shoot. Set your alarm clock, get up and come. Amen, right? You come, it's air-conditioned, amen? It's nice. We got a fireplace out in the foyer in the wintertime so you feel cozy. We got coffee. Get up. This is hard work. I got to get up, go to church, have a free cup of coffee, sit in the air-conditioned sanctuary. I'm not trying to minimize it, but I'm saying this is easy. God's calling us to do the easy, but he's also calling us to do things that aren't so easy, the hard things. And we can't rationalize those away like I begin to do with this impeller. We got to do the things that Jesus is saying to do here in the scripture that's hard. And this is where our walk with the Lord gets real. Because I think sometimes we don't fully embrace the life change that he's brought us to. I've had some health issues over the last several years, and I eat differently now, sort of, quite a bit, mostly. i got to be honest, you know. It's not something you do temporarily for a few months and then say, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's just how I do life now. So there's no thought process in me. It's like, I'll do this diet for six months and then go back and eat whatever I want. It's just the way life will be for my days on this earth. When you come to Christ, there's no going back. It's not something you do some things to get them over with, then you go ahead and do whatever you want to do. That's called being an atheist. You're just doing what you're doing as though God doesn't exist. No, you're called to live your life entirely uh, differently. So where you're working is a perfect example of maybe where some hard things have to take place. I'm sure... This isn't the case of church, uh, church staff especially, seriously. But when I worked at 3M, I, I noticed there would be some rivals and some 
competition for promotions, and sometimes people weren't people of integrity, and they would say some things that weren't true, and that kind of thing. So my question is this. Jesus says, love your enemies. So that rival there at work, it's enough. It's not enough just to say, well, I'll put up with you and ignore you and not befriend you. Jesus says you pray for that person. And not only do you pray for them, you pray for you to have love for them. This is hard stuff. This is changing the oil and the impeller kind of stuff. It just isn't easy to do. Um, you're called to, you know, not be angry. Jesus, you, it's been said don't murder, but I tell you, don't even be angry. So you can't be angry with family members. You can't be angry with your neighbor. You can't be angry with the checkout person that didn't do it fast enough. You can't be angry with the person that pulls out in front of you in Brookings and goes 15 miles an hour. They're in a hurry to get in front of you and make you wait for the next mile or two, which is really equates to 30 seconds of waiting. But still, you follow what I'm saying? We, you have to start saying the nitty-gritty is, I won't be angry. And then we're called to pray. We're supposed to pray for those around us. We're supposed to incede. We're supposed to seek the kingdom of God. Listen, if you don't pray for your family, if you don't pray for your circle of friends, if you don't pray for your relatives, my question to you is who will? Who knows them like you know them? Nobody. You need to pray for their souls. You need to pray that God moves in their lives. If they don't know Jesus, you need to pray for them to know Jesus. But you need to pray, 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 amen? Ask, seek, and knock. Pray. If you don't do that for your family... Who will? If you don't do that for your neighbor, who will? These are things that are a little bit more hard that we have to really be determined to do. So here's the challenge I want to leave you on this point. What do you know that Jesus is calling you now to live out? What do you know that Jesus is calling you to live out? It's one thing to know it. It's another thing to live it. Knowing isn't spirituality. Living it out is where really the life of Christ comes to be in you. You've got to live it out. So what do you know that God is calling you to live out? Because storms are coming. It's not when a storm comes. It's not if a storm comes. Jesus said it will come. It's just a matter of, of timing. And at some point in your life, you're going to face something tough, an illness, a, a, a death of a loved one, Right? You're going to face some kind of trouble that's way beyond your human capacity. And if you haven't known Jesus and put his ways into practice, that storm will cause a great crash in your life. So here's the outcome I hope we have. Knowing and practicing the teachings of Jesus builds a foundation to face the storms of your life. Knowing and practicing the teachings of Jesus builds a foundation to face the storms of your life because storms are coming. Let's go ahead and close with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me, please, this morning? Lord God, I want to thank you for Jesus. I want to thank you for his words. His words are life. They're truth. They're the way we should go. I pray that we become people who read, meditate, memorize your word, Jesus, that it's on our hearts, on our tongue, it's in our minds, it occupies how we think, it occupies our viewpoint, it changes our landscape of life, it just changes how we do things, Lord, uh, because it's so in our hearts. I pray, Lord, that we become people who readily, readily know your word. So we know, so to speak, the grease fittings that otherwise would be hidden and the oil that needs to be changed that we might not know about. So we know these things so that we don't have that moment of brokenness or that moment of stinking things up just because we're not knowledgeable. So grace us, Lord, with, a, with an urgency and a desire and a perseverance of knowing your word and knowing you, Jesus. And then, Lord, I pray we put them into practice that we do the hard things in life, that when we're mad and we shouldn't be mad, that we begin to say, okay, I know I'm sitting right now. I know that I'm not supposed to be mad. Jesus, give me the grace to love my enemies, to love my rivals. Give me the grace to, uh, to uh, not mistreat others just because I've been mistreated, Lord. And I, I just pray, Lord, that we truly walk in your ways and truly embrace them as the way to do life, that it's just not something temporary or something we do every now and then to get out of the way so we can move on and do what we want. But I pray, Lord, rather it become the way we just do life, that it would just become embodied in us in our doing. We love you, Jesus, and we give you glory, and I pray that may it be so. In your name, Jesus, and all God's people said,
Hey, if you want further prayer this morning about anything that's going on in your life, you are welcome to make your way out by that sign that says chapel over there, and our prayer team will gladly uh, pray with you and lift these things up to the Lord. God bless you. Go in his name. You're sent.